Hey, appreciate you guys that are here in person. Appreciate you guys that are watching on camera. We're here at our bi-weekly free seminar. We're not at Lake Fort Marina. Oh, no, we're not. No, we're not. We're, yeah. we're actually all the way down in Waco, Texas, and this is Throw It Again Tackle. This is the owner, Neil McClendon, wanted to have us down. By the way, the LGB rods are custom-made, one-at-a-time, American-made, American blanks all the way through. Um, really proud to have those rods came out. If you guys are in Central Texas and you want to check them out in person, my man Neil's got some in the store. They're actually right there on the wall. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I appreciate you for that. So, Neil, you kind of got a unique shop down here, man. You kind of got it's – it's a smaller shop right now, but you're just kind of starting it, and it's, it's a lot of local tackle vendors, like stuff you don't see – most places that's right yeah yeah stuff that you're not going to find in the big box stores right. uh stuff that's local uh made right here and uh so yeah. texas and then uh zoom in on central texas yeah yeah now see i keep a boat pretty well stocked doing what i do brother like i guide a lot by the way we're going real in-depth on sight fishing so if you're interested in learning some top secret guide tips on sight fishing stay tuned for that mm -hmm. but i keep a boat really stocked like with a lot of good stuff more than the store I mean, maybe Here's my point is, I did a lap around here when I first got here before we started this video, and I took some stuff out of here. Like, I got, I got myself some stuff. I mean, you got some good stuff in here. Like, things that are, like, that VMC drop dead hook I picked up over there? Yes, sir. You don't see that anywhere, and if you ain't never fished a Cinco on a VMC drop dead hook, you're messing up, because it adds some shimmy, and you definitely get more bites. So you got some awesome stuff in here, man. You're doing a good job. Hey, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah we appreciate, appreciate you that. having us. Thank you yes, very sir. much, brother. Appreciate okay, it. You guys yes, check sir. it out. Waco, Texas, throw it again, tackle. Let's talk sight fishing. It's uh, It started early on Fork this year. And we're not going to go into some of the semantics of, you know, whether it's happening now on your lake or not. Because I know in Central Texas, we probably got some lakes with deep, clear water that ain't spawning yet. And in East Texas, we got some flat, dirtier lakes, and they're already spawning. Um, but whether your lake is clear or dirty, there's a lot of stuff in sight fishing. It, the most of it is the same. Like a sight fish is a sight fish. Like a fish on a bed is a fish on a bed. And while they're all a little bit different, they all have, they, they as a whole have some similarities to them that we all need to know, right? So I'll just go over equipment real quick because the equipment's pretty simple. And, and this is. I see this so much with guide customers and people on the water and they're like, well, man, if you throw that wacky worm in there or if you throw that drop shot in there or some guy's talking about putting an egg weight in front of his crankbait and make his crankbait bounce up and down in the bed. None of that matters. None of that matters to catch a bed fish in my opinion. It is about finding out what spot that fish wants to defend, how willing he is to defend it and irritating his butt off. And some fish, you gotta hit them in the, right in the middle of their body. And some fish, you gotta keep it in front of their face. And some fish, you gotta swim it in real quick, let it fall, hop it out. It's just in there for a second. And just over and over and over again. So they all have different personality traits, right? So what I'm trying to get a point, the point across here is, the bait you're throwing does not matter. There's a few uh, characteristics I like a bait to have for sight fishing, just for a practicality standpoint. So for me, I like to have a short and compact bait so that they can't bite the back of it. If you throw a lizard or a brush hog, it's easy for them to bite the back of it and not get the hook, right? We can see how that happens. So this is a six inch stroker crawl. It could be a rage crawl, it could be a bandito bug, all of which I've seen here in the store. Um, you've got all those, but anything that's short and compact and has swimming appendages. I don't really want big flapping appendages. I'd rather have appendages that swim a rocket crawl from Zoom is, or a, well, speed crawl. Speed crawl. Speed crawl from Zoom is another good one, short compact that swims. All that's good stuff. Uh, the other combination is the weight and this little glass bead. So this little noise right here, y'all hear that over there? When you put a bait in the bed and you sit there and shake it or rattle that handle like you see Drew Cook doing, he got that from me by the way, I'm just saying. We've been doing that on your Lake Fork Guy videos for a lot of years. No, but yeah, everybody saw Drew Cook went on Santee last year, he was rattling that rod. When you add that little bead on there, that noise that it makes in that bed, I've literally seen bed fish that won't come to a bait and you rattle that bead and they are swimming away after you threw it in there and they turn around when you rattle. That noise is a big deal. And then the other thing is the color red. Come on in brother. Come on in, you ain't gonna hurt nothing. So the color red when you're bed fishing seems to fire them up. I, I really do like to throw red flake baits. This is a green pumpkin with a black back on it. Only reason I'm throwing that one is because I ran out of the red flake this week because we were catching a lot of bed fish. Mm. But the red flake, like just a watermelon red or a green pumpkin red flake, California 420, any of those type of colors are my favorite colors to throw on a bed. But it really doesn't matter. What about white? <laughs> no. 
That's bad That's for. Z curl. That white Z curl. Bad for multiple reasons. White is bad, so I'll tell you why white's bad. So white is is bad because it doesn't look as natural. So I feel like more fish are going to bite a natural color than they will a white bait. That's just my personal feeling. You could argue with me, and you might be right, and I might be right. We don't know. Here's what I do know. White, a lot of people throw white so they can see the fish eat the bait, right? I think that's why most people throw white. It's not because they, they bite it better. They throw it because they want to see the fish eat the bait. That's the worst thing you can do is see a fish eat a bait because there's times when that fish is just going to charge at it, and that bait will disappear because he'll get right on top of it. And he never even opened his mouth. And now you go, whoo, and you rip that bait right across his face, you can spook him. Or they'll just bite it and not really have it. They'll be biting and spitting, rip the bait away from them. You can spook those fish and lose fish by doing that. If you get a bait that you can't see them eat, it will force you to feel that fish. It's a Texas rig. At the end of the day, guys, it's a Texas rig. And you need to set the hook the same way you do when you're just pitching a Texas rig. So how about the hook in that? In that not, are we EWG? Are we not straight? EWG. I use an offset straight shank. It's kind of an old school worm hook. I think you could use a flipping hook if you wanted to and you wanted to use big gear. That's not what I like to do, but it's just a three odd or four odd offset straight shank hook like that right there. And you want whatever it is, an EWG, you know, the hook point points right back at the eye. So when, anytime you're flipping, if you can get away with it, you stay away from EWGs. You want a hook that has bite. So when I put it on a flat surface, does that hook point catch the table? Yes. On an EWG hook, it'll slide right across the surface. So you want something that has, you know, the bite is the difference between here and here. And that's what you want. That's going to give you a higher, higher hook percentage, right? Because a lot of these bedfish are finicky biters. They're not really just hammering down and getting the whole bait. They're just biting a piece of it, biting the back of it. So you want every advantage you can to get the hook in them. So that's kind of what I was leading to if you ever expose the hook. I know there's been times where I've had to... I've had to expose the hook yeah. because of that finicky bite just to drive, the, drive it in. That's a good question. So I don't, I don't expose the hook, but I get real close to it. So even though on a hook of this style, you're supposed to just kind of stick the hook in the middle of plastic when, with this style hook, like when you're just normally flipping. I don't. I actually rig it like an EWG where I go all the way through what they call tech exposing the hook. It just goes all the way through the bait where the hook point is sticking up through the bait like this. And then we bunch it up and just skin hook it. Where I mean, it's barely in there. Now, where I'm at, we're throwing, we're fishing around a lot of flooded grasses and bushes where these fish are up spawning. So you got to have a weedless presentation. You, if you have a hook point exposed, you won't ever present the bait to the fish. It'll be hung up junk the whole time. Okay, and, and we'll explain here in a minute about how we bring this bait it into the bed. And you definitely go through some of that junk before you get in the bed. So that's important. Um, but yeah, to get off the white deal, man. So many guys are on the white deal. Like, you'll catch a, such a high, you'll land such a higher percentage of your bed fish that bite if you feel them before and don't see them. Does that make sense? Yeah. You got to feel them move off with it. Just like if you're pitching Texas rig and you get a bite, what do you do? You get a bite on Texas rig, you go, you feel him either hold it and feel spongy or you feel him move with it and then you set the hook. Same thing on a bed fish, same thing. Uh, the rest of the gear, I'm using a 7-2. We call it a heavy light. It's just kind of between a medium heavy and a heavy rod. You don't want to overpower your gear on bed fishing because you're from here to that counter a lot of times. You know, sometimes you're a little further. But if you overpower your gear, man, you can lose a lot of your medium-sized fish. If you get too heavy rod, your three and four pounders, good tournament fish, you can lose those fish because when you jerk on them from that distance in that shallow water, they'll come right at you with a bigger rod. So it's a heavy rod. I want to be able to control an eight-pounder when I hook it, right? But at the same time, I don't want it to be too heavy where I lose my three and four pounders. So for us, that 7.2 heavy light, kind of between medium, heavy, heavy, that's the right one. 17 pound fluorocarbon is what I use 100% of the time, never have any issues with it uh, as far as break offs go. One thing about using that glass bead and it rattling and doing all that, it will slowly chafe your line. So you'll feel like after you've used it on a couple fish, you can pull your weight and bead up a little bit and feel right there. If you feel any roughness on your line, retie. You have to retie a whole lot when you're using a glass bead because it will put fatigue spots on your line and you start slowly chafing that line. And then on a reel, you know, on a reel, it's whatever reel you want. It doesn't have to be anything fancy, but uh, you're going to want a high speed gear ratio because when they get all, some of them will spawn out off the bank and we'll talk about that here in a second too, but the ones that spawn up on the bank bank, when you set the hook on them, they're coming to you, bud. They got nowhere else to go. 
Like they're coming, as soon as you set the hook, they're swimming right at you. So it's important to have like a seven five to one, an eight to one type of gear ratio reel because you'll need to catch up to those fish that come right at you and a lot of them will when you're bed fishing. So that's the equipment, that's the simple part. Now comes the advanced part that, you know, I've spent a lot of time looking at bed fish and I do it on arguably the most pressured per acre lake in the country. I mean, there's no other lake that's a destination lake that's anywhere near as small as Fork. Uh, if you look at, you know, the Gunnersville, Okeechobee, Toledo Bend, Rayburn, Falcon, Clear Lake, any of these other destination lakes that people travel from over the country to go to, they're all three times as big at minimum. You know, Toledo's six times as big. Uh, lake Fork's 27,000 acres. Most of those other lakes are over 100,000. I think Falcon's 80 something. Um, but most of those lakes are over 100,000 acres. So they're well, well, well bigger. So per acre, these fish on Fork, Man, they get pressured a lot, and it's a great training ground because of that. So when you're bed fishing on fork, you ain't just gonna roll up on a fish, see him on a bed, drop your poles, and flip in there and catch. Like you do that on fork, you might catch one or two a day. You know, and we're talking about we want to go out there and catch 30 pound bags. We want to catch 15, 20 fish a day. We want to bed fishing at least catch 10 a day. If you just go about it like you do on most, like a lot of people do on other lakes, you will never do that on fork. Those fish way more pressured, way more weary and, and aware of boats. And, and it's just harder to catch those fork bass because of the pressure they get. So one thing that I like to do a lot, number one, for a couple reasons, is I really like to look for fish that other people aren't seeing. The ones that really aren't very visible. I, you know, it's called sight fishing, but I catch a lot of fish that I'm not seeing when I'm flipping to them. What I do is I get my boat in the depth of water at the right angle, because glare matters when you're looking for fish, right? Like you gotta, when you get out there and you're ready to go down a bank looking for fish, first thing you need to do is you need to look in every direction around you, all the way around, there's some sight fishing going on right there, all the way around you, right? And you need to see which angle do I have the least glare? You know, that white cloud sheen on the water that the sun puts on there? I've actually caught fish off that top. Oh, have you? That's good. No, dude, I don't recognize that Yeah. Anymore. I don't, I'm not sure which one that is. There's a bunch of fish back there spawning right now. I know that. Is that Glade? That is Northwest Bay. That's, that's down by the golf course. <laughs> hey, my man over here. Said, hey, I, I, he's got to say something. Yeah, Keep it coming. I like it. So, so what I like to do, I get my boat. First, I, I analyze the glare angle, right? See which direction I can see the best in, see the deepest into the water. Then I get my boat where I can barely see, if there's like a light spot to a dark spot in the bottom, wherever I can barely make that out, like I've got to kind of strain to see that, I want my boat just off that depth where I can look in that depth right here beside my boat. So you would not believe how many fish are spawning. And here's the beautiful thing about this, whether it's a clear water lake and they're spawning in 15 foot of water, or whether it's Lake Fork and they're spawning no deeper than two and a half because it's dirty right now, it's always the same. These fish have to have light penetration for their eggs to spawn, for their eggs to hatch. So they will always spawn only as far out as the light can penetrate. And if you get out there where you can barely see in the bottom, whether that's 10 foot, five foot or two foot, the bigger fish will be on that edge where you really can't see them, but you can kind of see them. Like if you get right over the top of them and it moves a little bit, you saw that shadow move. I cannot express to you guys how important that is to look for those fish. Because if you find on a pressured lake, nobody, very few people are throwing at that. It's out off the bank, it's kind of out in the middle of nowhere, outside the flooded stuff, whatever, and you got a fish out there that's spawning right underneath you, and if he'll sit there and stare down your 20-foot boat till it's on top of him before he moves, he's gonna bite. Like nine times out of 10, that fish will bite. And all I do is I find those fish, and I keep going past them, I try not to crank the trolling motor, I just go real slow and ease past them, and I'll get out 15 or 20 feet off that fish, and I'll start flipping, Forgot this part, when you see that fish, you better look at something up here on the bank or something around you to mark exactly where he is. Because it gets real hard to, to decide like, okay, that bed was right off the corner of that counter if there's not a reference point in your mind. Like once you flip around and get back out there, your perspective is changed and it gets hard to be pinpoint where that bed is. And if you're not pinpoint where that bed is, you're gonna sit there and flip to nothing over and over and over again. What about your forward facing? I mean, is it, is it, so perspective view, I yeah. some folks use that. I was thinking of shallow water, so, maybe it's gonna broaden that. I think, I think if you've got a lake where fish are spawning a little deeper, that has potential to work. If you've got a lake, like right now a fork with the water being dirty because the water just came up and all that stuff, all, the most you can see down is about two foot, two and a half foot in the clearest water on the lake right now. Man, that's just, 
that's just too skinny to really make them out. And with all the other stuff that's in the water at Fork, if you try to use forward facing sonar on two and a half foot water on Lake Fork right now, you're picking up things everywhere you look because there's so much junk in the water. Well, just no, just I mean like flooded bushes and stuff like it, it becomes hard to get dialed in on where that blob is because as you pan that around, you're on this bush and this bush and that's coming in and out of your screen, right? So in just in that shallow water with that much stuff in it, it's hard. If it was more open water, it'd probably be more viable. Um, but right now it's just kind of tough to do that on there the way it's set up. So I actually did try that the other day on one that I couldn't see. I flipped my forward facing sonar on my active target and was trying to look for him. And I was like, yeah, I know he's by that stump. And I saw that stump and like, I saw him one time and then I couldn't ever really find him on the screen again. And it's just, what do you shut it off? Yeah, I just shut it off. Fishing? I don't have any electronics on at all when I'm sight fishing. Yeah. yeah. So, but if you'll mark that bed and like, let's say, okay, that bed's in line with the corner of that counter and it's about 10 feet out. Now I'll flip out, get 20 foot back behind me, and I'll pitch past that fish and swim that bait into the back of his bed and then just start shaking. Usually those fish that nobody else is looking for that are deeper, five, 10 minutes tops, you catch it. Sometimes it's first flip. I mean, a lot of times it's first flip. If you get off that fish and give him some time to settle back in before you flip in there, he'll bite. And it's That's just- the male, the male, we're picking him up. Male or female. In the box. Can they go for the female? Male or female, you can't put them in the box on four because we got a slot limit. A lot of our males are in that slot. Um, and I don't necessarily think that's the best way to do it anyway. So it, if you catch a male off a bedded pair, now I'm not telling you guys to not fish for the ones that you can see, right? Like the obvious ones. Like if the obvious ones are sitting there staring your boat down and they're not moving off that bed, they're locked in. Yeah, catch them. That's an obvious one. On Lake Fork, most of those obvious ones have been stuck like more than once. You know what I mean? Like they've been caught a few times that day probably by the time the afternoon rolls around. Yeah, like legitimately. They, fight like there's fish that'll get caught three or four times a day on yeah. fork yes that are locked onto a bed that are real aggressive yeah they will um what was it you were just saying you just asked me about something and i was going to go in on it uh, well so possibly the, 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 the clear reservoirs that we have here and and we do have fish that'll spawn in and i like what you said it was deep about the sun penetration yeah so if if, if, if i'm fishing some rocks that's you know eight to ten foot yeah i've seen fish where they'll come out and they're starting to spawn you'll see yeah. the males around they're always going to spot on the edge of the light penetration so wherever we can see with our eyes they'll spawn that deep and some will spawn deeper than that that you'll never see but they're going to be close to where you can barely see the bottom looking straight now so is that something you need to educate yourself on or is that something that you're keying in on with your own eyes yeah on the water yeah no that's just you just go out there and you start and where you can't see and you slowly work your way in so you see a change in the bottom oh okay we're right here that's the depth it is i need to stay around that depth and look from here in and your sunglasses aren't going to change that like with my naked eye well yeah no you need sunglasses that's what kind of sunglasses are you know what i mean yeah so i'll let you guys look at these these are wiley x's i mean i think all of them are pretty much making pretty good lenses these days right like coasters are fine um amphibias are great those waterland ones that six cents make are great like all these glasses now, all these copolymer lenses, which is what most of us are using copolymer. There's a few guys that have the true glass lenses. You know, there's some people that swear that makes a huge difference. Hey, I've had true glass and I've had copolymer and man, there's just not that big of a difference, guys. There's really not when it comes to pin. The most important thing is getting the right lenses. And you'll see, I'll pass these around. It's filthy dirty right now. But uh, if you kind of just look through it a little bit, you'll see how light these are. They're, they're, these are not a dark glass at all. I mean, this is a bronze, huh? It's even a step lighter than amber. So I found these before this year and I've been using them. They work really well, especially on cloudy days. Everybody knows amber lenses, lighter lenses, yellow lenses are great for cloudy days. But man, I'm gonna tell you on bright days, I kind of see just as good with these as I do with the green mirror and all that, you know, or, any, or a darker mirror, darker color lens. It really doesn't help you any. These kind of work in all conditions and it's, one pair of glasses, the Wiley X's, I think are like 160 bucks or something. They're not too bad price wise. And uh, man, they've been working really well. And if you look through them, I'm telling you, even in a light room like this, it brightens things up. And you can see, you can definitely see in the water. So y'all pass those around, check, that, check out that lens. I tend to go with the darker lens because I don't want the fish to see my eyeballs. <laughs> That fish, that fish, out of all, hey, out of all that man meat you got, your eyeballs ain't where he's looking. I assure you, brother. I assure you. Mm -mm. No, I, I bought those. I bought those just like you guys would buy them. I went into Academy, was looking at glasses, found those lenses and loved them and bought them. Yeah. And, and it been, those, are, those have been my favorite sight fishing glasses so far just because of the brightness of the lens. So, no, I don't have any sponsorship affiliation on any of that. No.
Yeah, they are. They're bright. I, they're light and bright. Don't yeah. be afraid. Maybe it's just lose them. Yeah, don't lose them. Running, you know, put it on my head. Well, don't do that. Don't do that. Here's how you solve that. Don't, don't do that. that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably, hey. You're my new voice of reason. Yeah, so. yeah. Lake Fork is uh, eating a few pair of my sunglasses over the years. That's for sure. There's, I got a few pair in there. So. Oh, he's about to do push-ups. Watch this. There, I'm doing push-ups. Oh, yeah. I can do real push-ups. Those weren't on my knees. He said I was on my knees. Uh, all right, so... That's the approach. So you look from the outside in. If you got the shallow ones that are obvious, especially when like it gets less pressure, by all means catch those. But try to find those deeper fish. Not only are those fish gonna be easier to catch, but man, that is you want to talk about finding the real big ones, like the real big ones on a bed when a female rolls in. Man, those eight plus pound fish, ten plus pound fish. I, I can probably count on one hand how many of those fish, like a ten pounder on a bed that I've seen on the absolute bank where she's super obvious to see. In all the years and the thousands of bedfish I've looked at, I can count on one hand how many 10 plus pounders I've seen where it's real obvious to see her. You almost always have to just kind of see a shadow, you know what I mean? So that's, that's, something that, that's a big deal there. Um, now, let's talk about how to get on the bite. So the number one thing is try, mistakes happen, but you need to do everything in your power to not do what I call dive bombing the fish. You, you know, that fish is on a bed. You don't want that bait landing on that bed. You don't want to flip from 20 feet out. The other thing is when you set your boat up, even on the ones you can see real good, we didn't go over that, so let's go over that real quick. When you, where do you stop your boat? Well, on the ones you can't see at all, if you can get to a point where you can at least make out the color change in the bed, that's great because then you can make sure you're being accurate. But you don't, you're not going to see the fish anyway, so you don't want to get too close. Even if that means that you got a blind flip and you can't see anything at all, you don't want to get, I wouldn't say you don't want to get any closer than about me to that cash register from those ones that you know you're not going to see anyway. That's about as close as you want to be. That makes a huge difference on how easy it is to catch them and get them to bite. On the ones you can see, what I like to do, even if it means that I'm, you know, almost having a cast to them instead of flip, right? I want to get as far away as I can, like when I can first barely see the fish. So when I'm, I've spotted the fish, I've gone past it, I'm looping back around to set up on it, right? The first moment that I can make out that fish on that bed, poles are down. I'm stopping right there. I'm going to flip from as far away as I can and still barely see the fish so that I know if he's nosing down on the bait, if he left the bed, what he's doing. The other thing is don't land in the bed, cast past it, and then do what I call the thumb and lift is what I call it. So, so when I flip, you know, I got a right-handed retrieve reel, but I flip right-handed like most people that do it wrong, right? You're supposed to do it left-handed. I do it wrong like everybody else. So I'll flip it out there, and when that bait lands, I'll have it in this position right here. You always thumb your spool when the bait lands. The moment it lands, I lift. Well, what that does is as soon as that bait lands, it slides under the, right on the surface where I can see it. And so now I can drop it right in the back of the bed every time. Because if I just hit that thumb and lift it instantly, the instant it hits the water. Most guys, when I try to tell them to do it on guide trips, they let it sink down where they can't see it. And then they try to swim it in and guess based on where the line's going in. Man, based on how far you are away and how deep that water is, if you're trying to guess it on where your line's going in, you're going to be wrong a lot. You're going to drop it too far back. Most of the time, you're going to drop it too far forward. Your bait's going to fall in the front part of the bed, and you're not even going to present it to the fish. You've got no chance at that point. So it's real important to do that thumb and lift. As soon as it hits water, lift, slide it right along the surface, and you can drop it right in. And as soon as you get it where you want it, you just point your right at it, gives it a lot of slack, it drops right in. So that's a big deal, getting in the right spot of the bed. Now, once you have swam that bait into the back of the bed and dropped it, you've got it on the ground. This is a key fundamental I see people make a mistake on. So most people, they look at their hand and they think, well, I'm just barely shaking the bait. Look at that rod tip. How much is that rod tip moving right now? It's a lot, right? Like when I'm shaking a bait in a bed, it's like, my hand's not even moving. Like my hand's not, I'm just shaking the rod tip. And I'm just getting right where my line's tight and getting just a tiny bit of slack in it and just shaking that slack. The object is to get that bait to quiver and make those little swimming appendages. That's why I like swimming appendages, not big flappers. I want thin ones because they move easier, right? With less pressure. So you just want those appendages to kind of be just pulsing and flat, just a little bit of swimming, a little bit of flapping, but you don't want the weight and the head of the bait to really be moving forward. If you can shake it in place, the more in place you can shake it, the better, right? And that's why a lot of times I will put slack in my rod. You'll see me on videos put slack in my rod and go, right? That rod tip's going crazy when you do that, right? See that rod tip? 
So that means that bait's down there. It's not really moving forward because I'm not picking up any slack or lifting the rod at all. But that bait's in there going shaking, shaking, shaking. So that's a very good tactic on them right there. But that's the object basically is to shake it. Now, don't leave the bait in front of the fish for too long. So it's all about reading their behavior, right? So on my first flip, I try to do it out in front of the fish's head, close to it, you know, within a few inches or so. But I try to, so if I, if I pitch it and I'm off to the left, I'll kind of steer it right or vice versa and try to get it to where it enters that bed where it's going to go on a line just within a few inches of that fish's face is what I'm trying to do. Um, and I'll just slowly, can see. yeah, these are fish I can see, yeah. right? If it's a fish I can't see, we're throwing it in the middle of the bed and shaking. Pull it out, throw it back in the middle of the bed and shake it. That's all you can do. But those fish are usually easier to catch because they don't get pressure. So the ones you can see, get a few inches from the face and you slowly shake it as it works its way through the bed. And if that fish turns and looks and he starts staring at it and he gets still. If he, y'all know what I'm talking about, y'all seen a bed fish do that? Where they'll just look at your bait and there's a lock up. And your bait's four or five inches in front of it, but it's just staring at it. When they do that, I take it away from them. And when I say take it away from them, I mean put some slack in your line and snap it. Shoot that bait out of there. If that fish is staring at it and you rip it away, it's going to go like that, right? Like what would you do if you were staring at something? You'd go to find it. It gets that fish to kind of snap out of it. Snap out of it. Don't let them be comfortable. That's the number one thing is to make these fish uncomfortable. Like if they're willing to stay on that bed and keep coming back, you just keep making them more and more uncomfortable. Because if I come into your house, and I pester you and make you uncomfortable, at some point you're going to slap me. Right? Okay. They ain't got no hands, boys. They're going to slap you with their mouth. That's the deal. That's what you're essentially trying to do. It's like, I see people put a bait in there and let it sit still and just kind of do this. And I'm like, man, look, if I walked up to you and I went, you put up that for a long time, couldn't you? But if I walked up to you and I went, you're probably going to knock the crap out of me at some point, like pretty quick, right? So, and th that's essentially what you're trying to do to these fish. You're just trying to pester them, pester them, pester them, pester them, pester them. And, and so I'll, the way I work a fish, when I put it out in front of them, I'll see how they react. Sometimes they'll swim off. Sometimes they'll swim off and come right back. Sometimes they'll just nose right down on it. That fish is done. He's caught. He doesn't know it yet, but he is. So when they, if they'll stay there next to the bait or stay around, but they're not really coming up like they're about to eat it, the next thing I'll do is I'll work to their, what I call their ear hole, right on their gill plate. And now I'll start trying to swim that bait in behind their ear hole. Most of those fish are going to swim. When they see it come out, they're going to swim and turn. Once you get them to start doing this, and the faster they start doing this, they're getting ready to bite. When they start spinning, and the more aggressive and quick they spin, a lot of the bigger ones, when you first do that and spin them, they'll just kind of go. And then the more you do it, they'll go. And when they start flipping on it, they're about to bite. So. Start working it to their ear hole. Some of them that just get real complacent and let you sit there and kind of tap the bait on their side, if they'll do that, hit them in the tail. They'll flip when you hit them in the tail. I've never met a fish that won't flip when you hit them in the tail. They will, if a fish will just sit there and you're just hitting it on its side and it's not moving up around the gill plate, if you hit it in the tail, it's going to flip. It can't see back there. It freaks it out. It irritates it. And that's the whole thing in a nutshell is seeing what these fish will let you get away with and how much you can irritate them. And the more you can irritate them, the faster you can irritate them, the faster you can catch them. That's the big key to being really good, like being great at bed fishing, is being able to catch them faster. Because everybody can kind of catch a bed fish or two here or there. But the guys that can catch 20 or 30 bed fish in a day and can take the time to go hunt for a bigger one because they already got their limit. Like if you're a tournament, how many of you guys are tournament guys in here? Most of us, most of us. So when you're bed fishing in a tournament, that's a great thing about tournament fishing and a bed fishing deal. You only need to get, you only throw it the ones you need. You know, if you need 20 pounds, you ain't throwing it no two pounders, right? Like we're going, we're, we ain't stopping on less than three or four, right? If you need 25 pounds on a lake that kicks them out, you ain't stopping on anything less than four or five pounds. We know what we need. So the faster you can catch that fish, the faster you can start looking for an eight or nine. And the more fish you've seen today, the higher your chances are finding that eight or nine. So it's all about speed, man. It really is. And be in a hurry. Have a sense of urgency to get that bait into the boat and back into that bed as fast as you can. Like when you just reel a bait in because you're, you're fishing or whatever, like if you're flipping, punching grass or something, you just kind of reel it in and flip the next one. No, no, no. Once you snap it out of the bed, it's... I mean, get it back in there as fast as you can. The more you can keep it in there, the more it's going to irritate them. It's all the same principle, but these are all key things. And I'm going really in depth on some stuff about sight fishing because if you want to do it at the best level you can, all these little things 
are very important. If you just want to go out and catch a few fish off a of bed, take these basic fundamentals we talked about in the beginning of this deal and roll with it and you're good. But if you're trying to be competitive and you want to catch them the best you can, the speed at which you go in and out of that bed, the speed at which you can figure out how aggressive you can be with that fish, um, sometimes the speed at which you can decide that fish isn't catchable. That's another part of it, right? So let's talk about that for a second. So you got to know when to cut bait. I mean, there's some of that too. When you're, if you're driving, if you're trolling down a bank looking at beds and a fish sees your boat and goes, Shoo, don't even look back. I don't care if it's a new state record. Don't even look at it. You're not going to catch it, bro. Like if you flip in there two or three times and that fish will never come to the bed while your bait's in there, leave it. It doesn't matter how big it is if you can't catch it. And the only way you can take a chance on it, if you see a real big one and you want to try to catch it because it's so big, your best bet, if that fish won't stay on the bed and won't go to the bed while, while you're there flipping for it, your best bet is to get way away from it and go to a weightless plastic. Throw a fluke, throw a Cinco, throw a wacky worm, and just marinate it anywhere around that bed. Now, that's not going to work out real often. But every once in a while, one that won't stay on a bed when you're up near it, you can catch one on a weightless plastic when you get away from it. That's what I was going to ask. So the, the fish, that are, are they spooked? Or can you spook a, a fish that's on the bed? They're going to move off. But so fish, how far are they going away? Here, here's, they're all different. You, you are going to spook every fish that you put your boat, that you see. It's a matter of whether he's more determined to defend that spot to overcome his fear of you. You are spooking every fish that you see on a the bed. They are well aware your boat's there. 100,000%. But they are determined instinctually to protect this spot, right? So if they're determined enough to protect that spot that they will stay when your boat's there, then that is a good indicator that they will bite. When you put something in that bed, eventually they'll bite. If they see your boat and run, they are not dedicated enough to that spot. They're not locked in yet. That's what, that's what we mean when we say locked in. Like how committed to that bed is that fish? How determined is he to defend that, that spot? Um, a lot of them will stay a little bit when your boat goes by and then you flip in there and they leave. And as long as they come back pretty quick, you can catch them. It's gonna take a little longer, you can catch them. That's a fish you gotta be a little more patient and timid about hitting him with the bait. When those fish, when you flip it in that fish leaves and then it takes a while to come back, those fish sometimes it takes a little while to get them locked in enough where you can actually throw at them to irritate them. Some of those fish, you just got to kind of leave the bait in there and hold it in front of them and shake it and pull it out and do it again, pull it out and do it again, that type of deal. So, How about your weight in that situation? How are you, what are you looking at as far as weight? I typically use a 3 8 ounce weight. Sometimes I'll use a half ounce. Um, I can, you know, for me, I've been flipping a long time. I flip thousands of flips a day during sight fishing season. So I can flip a 3 8 ounce weight really far, really accurate. So it's about your deal. It, it can be a 1 ounce weight. I don't. The weight doesn't really matter. It, what matters is being able to pitch it from a good distance very accurately and get it in there and swim it in and control the bait. Uh, if you want to be a good sight fisherman, the first thing you got to be is a real good, accurate, long distance flipper. The further you can flip accurate, the better sight fisherman you're going to be. 100%. Out here after this. Yeah, I'm about two or three weeks into sight fishing season. I got, I got whoever wants it, whatever y'all want to fish, I'll whatever y'all want to flip I'll for. Take you. I'll take it. All right. <laughs> All right. Do the majority of your bites come in the bed and it's on bottom? Or are you getting like kind of more like reaction style drop bites? Does that make sense? And some, it just depends on the fish. More of them are when the, fish, when the bait's on the bottom. And the, and the action you're creating is Yeah, creating yeah, and, and, and I will do like little hops sometimes. I'll mix in some hops. If, and that fish, if I'm shaking and shaking and he keeps looking, 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 getting close and won't ever commit, I'll start snapping it a little bit, making the bait jump up and down and trying to get him to react. Um, some of them, every once in a while though, they, there are the ones that they just want to swam in there at them. Like you do that thumb and lift thing and dude, you do it quick. Like you, that bait hauls butt in there it drops right behind them, and that's how they, there are some that bite like that. The majority of them, it's on the ground, you're sitting there shaking it or rattling it, and they pick it up and walk off with it. That's the majority of them. Let me yeah. ask you something. Like the other day, there was a, I saw, I was looking at a man, saw a male building a nest. He was actually sitting there turning on it and fanning. Yeah, got you, got you. So I took the uh, wacky rig on me, and he was, the wacky rig got down there to him. Mm -hmm. He kind of looked at him like, Oh, hey, went back to work. Yeah. And if he, 
will pay attention to it. He should pay attention to it usually when you're hitting him with a bait. He's going to pay attention to it and he's going to run off. So um, there does come a time on some fish where you've got to force them to make a decision. Like when they're just not really doing anything, reacting to your bait in any way, they're kind of sitting off the edge of the bed. I always tell people, don't throw at a fish if it's off the bed. Throw it at the bed. Wait till it gets on the bed. If you're going to throw at the fish, wait till he's on the bed. But every once in a while, there's one that'll just sit on the perimeter and won't get up there. I'm going to throw at that fish. He's either going to get on that bed or he's going to get the hell out of here so I can move on. Like, I'll force him to make a decision. So, like, with that fish, he don't pay attention to wacky worm, pick up the Texas rig, flip it in there next to him, shake it. He don't react to it. Pitch it right behind him, hop it, hit him a couple times. If he still doesn't react to that a couple times, throw it in there, point your rod down and go, wham, slap the fire out of him. Hey, he'll pay attention at some point. And if that doesn't make him run off, if he'll turn around and start paying attention to your bait, you've got a chance to catch him. But normally, he's either going to turn around and start paying attention to your bait or he's going to leave. If he leaves, then you leave. And that's, that's the answer. You know, you just, you got to understand you're going to spend time on some fish that you're just going to come to realize, well, that fish just isn't catchable right now. You know, and that can change throughout the day, right? Like that deal about them females coming in throughout the day and locking on, like you see one cruising at 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. And by 3 p.m., she's sitting on a bed and it's one flip. Like that's a real thing, guys. Like that really, those, they do pair up and lock on better as the day goes on most days especially early in the spawning season like we are now later in the spawning season you can go there first thing in the morning they'll be there a lot more often then but right now a lot of times that female's not up there sometimes she is but a lot of times she's not there first thing in the morning it takes a little while for them to get up there so when you see the female cruising like the other day i saw one cruising yeah and she was over 10 15 foot of water coming yeah. in, in the back of a cove yeah and i saw a male come up and just start bumping her mm -hmm. that deep of water Mm -hmm. it, it kind of blew me away. So their bed is probably over there at that post, and it, she's like she's wandering, sunning out there, and he's going up there, bumping her, and nuzzling her, and trying to get her to go up there. Yeah, that's what that is. And that fish that's out there doing that until she gets up there is virtually uncatchable. They, they, those fish that are out there wandering and bumping each other, and they're way out off their bed until they get up on that bed, they are virtually uncatchable oh, yeah. you can catch lightning in a bottle if you pitch a wacky worm over there like once every three or four or five years like justin atkins did that in an mlf tournament on fork in 2020 he just saw a 10 pounder cruise down a bank and pitched a wacky worm in front of him and it bit and it's uh, the luckiest catch ever because like i've seen that a million times out there you can throw whatever you want to well, they just run away from you you know so that it's pretty much that fish is just about uncatchable until she goes over there now that's one that when you see that when the male's rubbing on her stuff you're going to want to come back and look in that area that afternoon in a few hours because it could be anywhere from an hour to four or five hours later. She's probably going to be locked on. Yeah, absolutely. We've got a lot of those pockets where it's, you know, 10 to 15 foot of water. You've got a vast area, you know, I mean, as big as this room, but then you've got, you've got big chunk rock. And usually that's where the bigger of those fish are. But then you'll see the males on the outside edge. You want to pick those up. But, man, it's, it, they're so far in between. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it makes it tough. Yeah. Uh, but before we get there, so pegged or unpegged? Pegged, but with a little gap. Good question. Good question. So, as you guys can see right here, this is about, I'll leave about a quarter inch gap. Let me show that to the camera real quick. And what that does is keeps that weight pegged, keeps it from falling off into the junk and my bait getting separated from it. But it also allows me the room to get that little tick tick noise. Everybody see that? It's about a quarter inch. Got bobber stopper, quarter inch gap, three eighths ounce weight, glass bead. And we're red because they seem red? We're red because that seems to irritate the crap out of them when they're spawning. For what red just gets them going when they're spawning for whatever reason. I mean, and where I'm from in East Texas, red's kind of a good color on worms and stuff year round. You know, we throw that plum worm in the summer and we throw red, you know, lipless crankbaits in fall and winter and um, you know, red's just kind of a good color. It seems to get their attention. So, and I think so. There was a study at the University of Oklahoma years ago. That I heard Jimmy Houston say this. So, you know, who knows how true or whatever this is. But Jimmy Houston, so I was a kid. I took it, young guy, I took it as gospel. So, um, University of Oklahoma did a study on, on which colors fish can actually see the deepest in the water. So, at a certain point, you go deep enough in the water column, every color turns black. We all know that? Like, if you get deep enough in the water column, it's so dark that there's no color. It's all black. Like, we turn all the lights off in here and there's no clouds out, my white shirt will be black. You can't see the white, right? Same thing when you get deep enough in the water column. So, in that study, 
the colors that held their their color the deepest in the water column the first the deepest was red and the second was blue what we thought in the water is like black and what blue and red actually is a little bit better as far as them being able to see it in that darker deeper water so um red stands out the most red is the color that's the most visible to the fish in my opinion based on that study that jimmy houston was talking about and all i know is there's so like i used to paint before i used a glass bead i would paint my tunks in weights red for sight fishing season yeah and i learned that from watching shaw grigsby he was throwing a white bait but he had a red weight in it on top of that white bait he always put, so i'll pick that up from him started using it shaw grigsby one of the best sight fishermen of all time i mean of all of them, he's one of the very best of all time and uh, maybe the best, actually. And so I started using it, and it did seem to, it kind of seems to get their attention a little more when you have a little red on there. So I like that red bead. And I like red flake in my baits when I can get it. Yeah. Would it be weird to have a red hook? No, no, I'll use it. I think a lot of those red hooks that are made are not real good quality hooks. If you had a badass one. Yeah, like if you had a good black nickel hook that was painted red, yeah, I'm in on that. Yeah, yeah, I'm in on that. Yeah, you can paint you a black nickel hook. I don't, I don't know. Hey, you can get somebody to make it. There you go. Old bed fishing hook oh, special. <laughs> we'll, call it, we'll call it we'll call it the old bed snatcher. Old bed snatcher. Old bed snatcher. Yeah, that'll be good. So when you walk us through, like you came up on one and you had a good candidate and all the things were lining up, like walk us through your actions of like how you would, you know what I mean? Like was your first action be a, a snap or be the, the mm -hmm. broad tip? Like, you know, kind of walk us through your progression. All right, so once I'm set up on the fish, right? So I'm where I can just barely see the fish on the bed. Pitch well behind it, thumb and lift, swim it to the back of the bed, drop it. I'm going to try to do that at an angle that's just a few inches off that fish's face. I'm going to start lightly shaking. If that gets his attention, great. If it doesn't, we may rattle a little bit. None of that gets attention. I'll hop it a little bit, shake it again. He's still not looking. Snap, I'm out of the bed and back in. This time I'm going to try inch a little bit closer. I'm going to go right off the front of his face this time. Do the same thing again right off the front of his face. If he's still not moving, he's still sitting there, he's staying on the bed, but he's not nosing up. At any point, if he starts reacting and flipping and spinning, now I'm just gonna do the same thing until he bites. If he starts looking like he's about to bite at any point in this process, I'm just gonna keep doing that until he bites. So the third pitch, I'm gonna put it on his gill plate. And I'm gonna try to sit here and go like this on the, on the outside of his gill plate. I'm gonna sit there and just shake it where it just hits him under the chin, right? That don't work, we'll snap that over him, bring it out. We'll do it again. That doesn't work. We'll go to the middle of his body. That doesn't work. We'll hit him in the tail. Usually by the time you hit him in the tail, they've done something. They've given you some reaction. So it's that fast. I mean, it's five, six flips. I've already, I've already made my mind up. How do I need to work this fish? Is he catchable? What do I, you know, whether, do I stay or do I go? So. And then, again, for less accomplished casters, if you make a bad cast yeah. and you realize that, are you snapping it back and trying to get out of his vision and yeah. get back to an active Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Good question. So if you make a bad cast, so if it's going to dive bomb them, if it's going to land on the bed and you see that before it lands, stop it and pull it back before it ever hits water. And, that, and watch yourself because it may come right back at you. But yeah, just snap it and jerk it so it never lands. And so that fish never sees that bait go in on top of his head like that. That's what I like to do, especially at the beginning when I don't know how skittish or, or stuck they'll be. Um, if you make a bad cast out to the left or right side and it's not even going to come across the bed, just bring it in and go again. Yeah, if you're not in that bed, and you're not in line with that fish, you're not doing any good, Bubba. Yeah. You you're not going to catch them like that. Yeah, they're not, they're not going to leave that bed and go three feet out of it and come find you bait and bite it. That's, that's, I mean, if you find them like that, those fish are just so stupid. You need to text me let me know where they are because I'm in on that deal. <laughs> and, and if they're that aggressive, just quit doing that. Just run a swim jig down the bank and catch all of them, you know? But, yeah. Have you ever hooked one and then, you know, handed the rod over to a guy that couldn't catch them real good and let him reel it in? Never. Yeah. I've never I've never hooked a fish and handed it to a customer in my life. Okay. No, <laughs> no I, there are guides that do that. I've watched fishing guides do that. I think that is not what you're there to do as a fishing guide. As a fishing guide, now, there is plenty of times to this day that I have to make the pitch because there's guys that just can't make the pitch, man. Some of these pitches are really long and you got to put it on a spot like that and you need to do that over and over and over again at least seven out of ten times. Man, I got a lot of guys that can't do that. You know, there's just there's not a lot of people on earth that can do that from a certain distance, you know. And some of these pitches are really tough. So I do pitch for the customer and then hand him the rod and let him work the fish and catch it himself. But I've never hooked a fish and been like, here you go. No. That's uh no, that's a real thing. That's a real thing. I guess I can say this because this guy doesn't guide anymore. He quit guiding a few years back. But uh, Cody Malone had a great reputation 
And I think he lives down in Waco somewhere. Yeah. Cody Malone had a great reputation for being a great sight fishing guide. And I can't tell you how many times I watched him go, ooh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I had one of those guys that just couldn't pitch far enough. Yeah. I mean, you're right on the edge of the bank, and I'm like, you see that hole, right? I'm not fishing that hole. Yeah. You can see it, but it was just a pocket in the grass. And I was like, you got to get just behind it, let it yeah. fall in. He couldn't do it. He couldn't get it. Yeah. So I rinsed it out there, and it landed just on the edge, and I clicked it in and as I was handing him the rod. He just pulled tight. Yeah. And he just grabbed it and ran. And I set the hook, and I tried to hand it to him. He wouldn't take it. I'm yeah. like, man, it's your fish. Yeah. I mean, you take, no, you hook, you yeah. Play. Yeah. And that's good. And most people, I think, are like that. But there's some people, I guess, that, that will take it if you hand it to them if you hooked it. But uh, no, I've, I've seen some guys do that. Yeah. Golly, yeah, that does suck. And that, dude, that, there's times when, you know, as a fishing guide, you mess up and catch big fish in front of your customer sometimes. I mean, you don't want to do it. It does happen. If I can clearly see a bed fish, there is no reason. For me to ever set that hook. Because even if I'm flipping in there just to see what the fish will do and it bites, just lift and shake, it's going to drop it. Like someone may swim all the way around for a while, but eventually they'll drop it. Like you can shake them off when they're on bed. There's no reason for me to ever set the hook on a bed fish. It's why like there's a video that's going to come out next week where I actually go bed fishing by myself. And the princess here was my camera lady that day. But I'm bed fishing that day, dude, and I'm, I'm getting it. Because all week I ain't set the hook once. And so that one day, you know, normally on guide trips, you usually, a guide will catch one or two in the beginning of the day at least, you know, when you're just doing regular fishing. But in bed fishing, I ain't set the hook all week, dude. I was mad at him that morning. I was leaning on him, boy. I was all yoked up. Yeah, yeah, we had, we had some string stretching going on that day. But. So do you, do you ever use breaking line? Nope, nope, don't think, I think that's a terrible idea. <laughs> and here's why, there's no stretch and I'm from here to you. If I'm from here to you on a big fish and I got no stretch, you know what my odds are of landing that fish? That fish is not, it's not about that fish breaking the line. It's about that fish being so crazy and hot that close to the boat that he's gonna find a way to get slack in the line and come off. Yeah. That's what's gonna happen. You know, you need the stretch in monofilament or fluorocarbon lines. It's got less stretch in mono, but it's got stretch. And the, the reason we're not using a super big rod, you know, if I was going to do the braid thing, I'd be having it on a big stout flipping stick and, you know, big braid and you just jerk them. You need some shock absorption in that close range distance on big fish. You need the stretch of that line. You need the bend of that little bit smaller rod to absorb the violence that's going to occur when you hook an eight to 10 pounder from me to you. It, some of them are kind of lazy, but man, dude, when them big ones are in there hot and they just got to the bed and you hook one from the, it's chaos, bro. Like there's boat all, water all over the boat. I mean, it's crazy. They're splashing you. It's nuts. So. There's been times that I've pitched out an area and pulled four or five of them out of that same spot. Yeah. I thought, how is there even two right there? Yeah. But in that close proximity, from me to yeah. the corner right yeah. there. Oh, yeah, and like grass. Yeah. In grass or on a bush or something. Yeah, they'll get, they'll get that. That's not really spawning fish, but they, I mean, yeah, for sure. Like, you know, we always keep them. We're punching grass. Is that post-spawn? It can be any time of year when they're grouped up. I mean, they can group up any time of year like that. But, like, it's more like in that situation, it's about a certain tree that's holding a group of fish or a section of a grass mat that's holding, you know, it's hollow in there and there's some brim in there and there's a bunch of bass hanging out in there. And then once one eats, they're all coming out there looking to eat, you know, that type of deal. And, like, so when we're punching matted vegetation, like we're punching 100, like steel house, if you're punching on steel house, one ounce weight, one and a half ounce weight, creature bait, always have an extra flipping rod right there. And here's what you do. You flip, you get a bite, you set the hook, you reel that fish in, boat flip them in, grab that other rod and pitch it in there. You'd be amazed how many times you'll catch another one right there while that fish is flopping in the bottom of your boat right away. Like immediately. Like if you got a partner and you're fishing tournaments on still house, you got a partner, you ain't got to worry about that. And I think that's kind of illegal in a tournament if, for you to do it, right, without taking care of the fish first. I don't know, that's, that's kind of great. I don't know if that's illegal or not. But like if me and you are fishing a tournament, Neil, and I, I hook one, and you're with me, I'm going, hey, flip in there, flip in there. Like, before I'm even got, as soon as I get the fish out of that hole, flip it right in that hole. And you'd be surprised how many times you catch another one. They do, I mean, they group up. They, they, they hunt together. You know, most of the time when they're not spawning, they're hunting together most of the year, except for some, you know, exception fish that are bigger fish that are kind of loners. You know, most of the bass population are not by themselves most of the year. 
Man, there's been too many times I've caught fish like that, mm -hmm. and then just took too long getting it off the hook. Yeah, you let them cool, cool down. Yeah, yeah. And, and then I'll even move away and not even throw it right back in there. Yeah, don't do that. I'll be, I'll be. 20 yards down, you know, and just never, never yeah. think about getting when you, back. You know, other than bed fishing time, when you when you get a bite, you always want to throw back in that same spot. No, what we got going in this free spot right now is that you, you know, catch 40, 50 fish without ever even moving the boat. Yeah. Those, those when you get in the right, water, huh? What's that? Those stumps right now are underwater. Those stumps are now underwater. Yeah. Yes, those stumps are now underwater. Yep. Yeah, they sure are. If they're not, they're right at the surface. You know, Lake Fork's about two foot low right now. That's a horrible level. Because so many of those stumps are, the water's like right here. It's just, you just bump like, and you, when you get one of those coves that's got a lot of timber, man, you talk about just dun, 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 trying to get in there, get stuck on them, all that stuff. It's a pain in the butt. And I'll bring a ranger up there. You know, rangers are like the worst boat in the world by getting hung up on top of a stump. Dude, I feel bad for anybody running a ranger on fork right now, just trying to idle into a pocket. It's got to be a nightmare. Because the whole design is flat. I guess heavier, you know, I don't know. I mean, I know they're real heavy because of foam and stuff. But I just know rangers are real notorious, but they get hung on stumps bad. Any other questions? Well, man, I appreciate you guys. No one, I appreciate you guys letting me come down here and listening to me. And uh, I appreciate y'all hanging out the whole time and, and asking questions. And uh, Neil, thank you, brother. Yes, sir. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, we'll if y'all are, are Lake Fork in two weeks, we do this on Friday nights up there two weeks from now. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, buddy. All right, man. Thank you, guys.